Hello everyone and welcome to CRAMSurge, clinical research appraisal and methodology for surgical trainees, where we pick a paper fresh from the press on a hot general surgical topic. We review it for you, we present it for you, we critique its methodology for you and provide top of the field expert opinions and teaching on research appraisal and methodology. My name is Gio Perrin and together with Professor Sababella Subramanian, Adam Haig, Ben Wood and Josh Lau, we bring you Crown Surge from the wonderful region of the Yorkshire and the Humber. Today we are going to have a look at a paper that was recently published in JAMA Surgery entitled Robotic Inguinal versus Transendominal Laparoscopic Inguinal Hernia Repair, the River on the Mice Clinical Trial. Uh, this is followed by a teaching session by Professor Sababala Subramanian on odds, ratio and uh, relative risk. Okay, so um, my name is Tar Bambra. I'm one of the core trainees at uh, Northern General Hospital. Um, I'd like to uh, introduce my colleague who I'm presenting with today. Hi there, my name's Leonie. I'm another one of the CT2s also working in Sheffield at the moment. Okay, brilliant. And uh, welcome to Cram Surge. So today we have a paper um, that we'd like to present to you that's published in the JAMA Surgery uh, 2020, and it's a multi-center prospective um, clinical trial. Aims of the um, clinical trial, or we're going to cover the background, uh, the question that's answered, and um, the hypothesis. So the background, essentially, robotic inguinal hernia repair was described in general surgical literature in 2015. It had been previously described in urological literature prior to this. Um, allegedly, there are um, several benefits in comparison with laparoscopic inguinal hernia repair, such as improved uh, post-operative pain, better surgeon ergonomics. Um, however, these outcomes have not yet been proven in any uh, study uh, yet. Um, Leone, would you like to just um, elaborate on the question? Um, yes, yeah, certainly I will do. Thanks, Tar. Um, so uh, we looked at the question in the uh, standard sort of PICO format. Um, so the P for problem or patient population. Uh, so this study was looking at adults aged over 21. Uh, who hadn't previously had any abdominal surgery below the umbilicus. Uh, they were included if they had primary or recurrent unilateral inguinal hernias, but only if that uh, previous hernia had been fixed open. Um, and they had to have a BMI of less than 40. Uh, so the I of the PICO intervention was the uh, robotic approach to inguinal hernia repair. Uh, and the comparison was uh, sort of slightly more uh, traditional these days, uh, laparoscopic inguinal hernia repair. And the outcomes, which we'll go into in more detail, uh, were various post-operative outcomes and surgeon-related outcomes. So I'll hand back to Tar just to, uh, oh, sorry, I'll just uh, read the, the question as it was in the paper. So uh, does the robotic approach to inguinal hernia repair result in improved post-operative outcomes compared with laparoscopic approach? Uh, so now I'll hand back to Tar, who's just gonna uh, mention the hypothesis of the study. No problem. So yeah, the hypothesis um, that is uh, that is put forward is essentially will a robotic approach result in improved post-operative outcomes in comparison with a, a laparoscopic approach? So the methods, um, just looking closer at study design, um, this is a randomized uh, clinical trial. It was single blinded um, clinical pilot study um, with no power calculation. So essentially there wasn't any previous data um, to establish the correct sort of uh, sample size um, required for a study of this kind. It was multi-center with six academic sites um, across the United States. Prospective study, um, which uh, commenced in um, April 2016 and finished in April 2019, a total of uh, three years. Um, Leonie, I wonder whether you could elaborate on some of those methods that were adopted to reduce bias? Yeah, sure. So there are a few things that we picked out in the paper. Uh, so, for example, obviously uh, they randomised the patients and the patients were blinded to the intervention. So single blinded uh, study design. Uh, and there was some attempt to match the patients. So for some of the confounding factors such as age, sex, BMI and comorbidities. Uh, looking at the surgeon requirements uh, to try and reduce bias. Um, in order to participate in the study, surgeons had to have completed previously at least 25 of each approach, so robotic and laparoscopic uh, inguinal hernia repairs in the past. Uh, 
Um, it's also worth mentioning here that all the hernia repairs um, in the study, so both robotic and laparoscopic, were done uh, by the transabdominal preperitoneal approach. Uh, so, Tar, do you want to um, elaborate a little bit more on the outcomes that we mentioned before? Yeah, sure. So, typically, we see um, uh, what's described as a primary outcome in, in many studies. However, because we um, alluded to the fact that this is a, a pilot study, there was no um, in inverted commas, primary outcome. Instead, we had main outcomes, um, which were patient uh, recorded outcomes, and then secondary outcomes, um, which were mainly surgeon type outcomes. So the main outcomes, post-operative pain, uh, patient quality of life, mobility, wound mobility and cosmesis, and secondary um, surgeon outcomes included ergonomics and mental workload. Um, there were some other miscellaneous type outcomes, including uh, cost uh, and time taken to perform the procedure. So, Leone, I'll hand back to you to talk in a little bit more detail about the inclusion and exclusion criteria um, and how the patients were um, randomised. Yeah, that's great. Thanks. So uh, I think we've already mentioned a few of the inclusion criteria that the paper looked at. So adults aged over 21 uh, with a virgin abdomen and their hernia had to be primary or recurrent unilateral, uh, but only if they had not previously had any preperitoneal mesh placed and uh, they had to have BMI of under 40. And there were some exclusion criteria outlined in the paper as well, such as patients that were found to have a bilateral inguinal hernia at presentation patients who required an open repair, uh, some certain comorbidities such as end-stage renal disease or um, end-stage liver disease, um, or if the patients weren't able to consent either for the procedure or for participation in the study. Uh, we just included on the right there the flow diagram from the paper as, as to um, how the patients were um, included and then any that were excluded as well. Uh, so, Tar, do you want to just cover a little bit about the operative technique that was described in the paper? Of course, yeah. So, we used um, they used a, a standardised um, transabdominal preperitoneal approach. Um, there were three ports um, in either case and a poly polypropylene mesh of appropriate size between 10 and 15 um, centimetres uh, in diameter were used. Um, and in the laparoscopic procedure, um, the mesh was fixed with tacks um, and in the robotic procedure um, it was sutured. Um, closure of the peritoneum um, in the laparoscopic approach was done with again with tacks um, and in the robotic approach um, it was closed with a running suture of the surgeon's choice. Um, I highlight that last point that I made in terms of the fixation method because um, allegedly um, tacks are associated with increased pain um, in other studies. Um, so we'll move on. Um, and Leonie, do you want to talk a little bit further about the um, the clinic visits and when the data was measured? Sure. Yeah. So this is just a little bit about sort of how, how the data was collected, I guess. So um, the patient outcomes that we mentioned, patients were required to fill out a number of um, uh, questionnaires uh, that are detailed in the paper related to uh, things like pain and quality of life, as we mentioned. Uh, it's worth highlighting as well, it does say in the paper that all these questionnaires used are validated, so have been previously previously used. Uh, so these questionnaires were filled out at a pre-operative clinic visit, one week post-op and again at 30 days post-op. Uh, the SCAR evaluation questionnaire was filled out just at 30 days post-operatively. And the uh, surgeon factors such as mental workload and ergonomics, uh, these were uh, measures collected straight after each case, so while the case was fresh in the surgeon's mind. Uh, so moving on to the next slide, um, I'll pass back to Tar and we'll start telling you a little bit about the results. Perfect, yeah, so we, we briefly touched on um, the outcomes earlier uh, and, and described them as main outcomes and secondary uh, surgeon outcomes, so I'll just uh, go into a little bit more detail. So the patient reported outcomes, pain, quality of life, mobility and cosmesis, at all the three time points that Leone's just described to us, um, there was no uh, statistically significant difference in those outcomes between uh, laparoscopic and robotic um, groups. Uh, the surgeon reported outcomes, um, so specifically mental workload, um, uh, that's broken down into surgeon frustration and other types of index uh, such as effort. And um, there was a significantly higher surgeon frustration and effort in the robotic group. 
ergonomics, um, which allegedly is better in robotic procedures. Uh, interesting, interestingly, we found um, no statistically significant difference between groups. Um, wound morbidity, um, unintentional or unanticipated admission and adverse events, no, no difference either there. Um, there's a couple of others which are fairly significant in the context of robotic surgery, and I'll pass back to Leone to, uh, to tell us a bit more about those. Sure, yeah, so as we mentioned, the cost of the procedure was evaluated. And perhaps unsurprisingly, as robotics is a sort of newer field, uh, the robotic procedure is found to be statistically significantly more expensive. As you can see with the figures there, um, sort of above double the cost uh, on average there. Um, and the operating time was also significantly greater. Again, as, as you might expect with it being a newer technique, so 75 minutes versus 45 minutes. So some fairly significant differences there between the two groups. So if we move on to our next slide, uh, we're just going to discuss some of the limitations with the paper that um, that we found. Yeah, sure. So uh, I'll cover the self-reported limitations uh, here. So we mentioned before that there was um, no power calculation. So um, essentially, there was no pre-existing data available for post-operative pain, quality of life, ergonomics and the other outcomes that we mentioned. Um, so it wasn't possible um, to to derive a power calculation and work out an appropriate sample um, with that. There is a, a relatively small sample size of 102 uh, patients that went through with um, uh, sort of final analysis and collection of data, um, which is relatively small um, to draw any uh, sort of reliable conclusion. Then we, 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 we have the question of whether 25 cases is enough to call somebody proficient at uh, robotic uh, surgery. There is um, a couple of studies out there to suggest that this number is perhaps a little bit shy of uh, what's required to uh, to deem uh, somebody proficient, uh, a surgeon proficient in that technique. There were some other uh, limitations that we identified and I'll, uh, I'll let Leone uh, just elaborate on those a little bit. Sure, yeah, so these are just a couple of other points that we sort of discussed as possible limitations to study. So the fact that um, some patients had recurrent hernias that were included. Um, so although the dissection planes would be uh, different because the patients included were only those that had open repairs previously, we wonder whether, you know, uh, it could have made it a slightly more challenging case in any way uh, if a patient had had a hernia operated on before. Um, and sort of following on from that, um, Although our study that we've looked at didn't find uh, any particular benefits of robotic surgery for the simple hernias, it could be that uh, it might be beneficial for the more complex hernias, which weren't included, things like uh, sort of multiple recurrences or bilateral hernias, things like that. Uh, and lastly, just uh, the cost, obviously we highlighted that the cost was uh, much greater for robotic. Uh, it could be that the cost is going to uh, significantly improve over time as it becomes more commonplace. So it's just uh, something to think about how significant that is for a technique that's relatively in its in its infancy. So uh, we'll just move on to our last slide. Um, and Tar, would you like to just uh, hit home for everybody what the conclusion in the paper was, please? Yeah. So I think I think everybody who's um, who's listening probably has, has gathered that essentially the, there's no clinical benefit of robotic um, uh, inguinal hernia repair over laparoscopic inguinal hernia repair. Hernia repair. Um, robotic uh, surgery costs more and effectively takes longer um, and the surgeons appear to be more frustrated um, with no of the alleged ergon ergonomic benefits. Um, thank you. Um, okay, so um, we'll talk about measures of risk and uh, today we'll uh, talk about odds ratios and relative risk. We use these terms quite a lot often interchangeably and there's often a lot of confusion about what they actually mean and when and uh, which term should be used. So that's what we're going to talk, we'll talk about today. So we estimate um, and assess risk all the time. We communicate risk and we make uh, decisions on a daily basis based on our estimation of risk. Yeah, so um, I'll get this slide show up. So and we also need to compare estimates of risk with different approaches and, or interventions. We heard about the robotic versus uh, laparoscopic um, inguinal hernia operations, 
So the risk there would be recurrence or groin pain or complications. And you need to compare risk between the, between the two arms. Um, so that, that's a um, common thing we need to do as clinicians. Now, the two commonly used measures of comparing risk, one is the odds ratio and the other is the relative risk. So the OR and the RR. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And then we need to ask ourselves, do we really understand what these mean? And can we avoid pitfalls in their use? And I hope that at the end of the tutorial, um, uh, you'll all um, say yes to both these questions. OK, so um, this is a forest um, plot from a meta-analysis published very recently, just a couple of weeks ago, or maybe a little bit older than that, looking at um, the role of adjuvant radiotherapy after surgery in the treatment of adrenocortical cancer. It's quite an uncommon cancer. Um, and to see if adjuvant radi radiotherapy actually improves survival. So this, this meta-analysis looked at five studies, pulled their results together, and essentially uh, what they have here... Okay, something wrong with my... Yeah, got it. What they have here is um, at the bottom what they call a pooled odds ratio for adjuvant radiotherapy in improving overall survival and they report an, an odds ratio of 2.41, okay? So I look at the data and I said, let me calculate what the relative risk is. And I did uh, the calculation of relative risk based on the numbers that they have provided, and the relative risk is 1.44. And then I found that a particular study, the first one right at the top, published very recently in a top endocrinology journal, significantly seem to influence the results of all of this, the entire meta-analysis. So that one study had an odds ratio for survival for radiotherapy of 6.2, and my calculation showed me a relative risk of just 2.07. So there's a significant difference in two different estimates of risk. And you just wonder why did they present the odds ratio? Is it because it's a bigger number? and were they justified in presenting the odds ratio as opposed to the relative risk. Okay, so with this example in mind, you can see why it's important for us to have a clear understanding of these terms. So with this in mind, we'll talk about these two um, measures of risk in more detail. Before we talk about odds ratios and relative risk, we need to understand uh, some more simpler terms, um, and these are probabilities and odds. So probability, um, designated as P here, is simply the likelihood of an event happening. So you toss a coin, and if you um, like heads, so the prob you say that the probability of heads would be 1 in 2. So that's probability. Odds, however, is the ratio of the likelihood of an event happening to the likelihood of an event not happening. So again, if you toss a coin and you want uh, to know what the odds are for heads, then you say the probability of heads is half, the prob probability of tails is half, so half over half is one, so the odds, rate, uh, the odds uh, for heads would be one. So we like dealing with probabilities. Probability is much more intuitive for us, and um, odds is something that we don't usually um, uh, talk about. It's used in, uh, people refer to odds in gambling, and you just got to remember that odds actually refers to probability of the event happening divided by the probability of the event not happening. Okay, we'll give you some more examples. Right, so um, this is a table that I'm going to go through. This, is, uh, this describes an experiment and then an event or success and how we define it. And then we're going to talk about the probability of that event and we're going to talk about the odds of that event. So a few examples, um, hopefully all of that will make sense, and we're going to look at the probability and the odds. Right. So first, we take a toss of a coin, like I've just described. If you say that the event that you're interested in is getting heads, then you say the probability is 0 0.5, and the odds will be 1. Now I'll pause at the end of the slide, and if you haven't understood it, uh, let me know, and I'll explain again. So the probability of heads is essentially the chance of you getting heads, which is 1 in 2, which is 
the odds of heads is the probability of getting heads divided by the probability of getting tails. So then they are the same, and that's why the odds is one. Okay, so we'll move on to the next example. Let's say you're throwing a dice, and your um, event is getting a multiple of three. So you, you can get three or six to call um, that uh, throw a success. So the probability of getting three or six out of six values is one third or 0.33. And the odds of getting three or six is one third divided by two thirds. Because we said the odds is the probability of you getting multiples of three divided by the probability of you not getting a multiple of three. So the odds is half. Okay. Let's go on to another event, another experiment, random selection of a month. And let's say you're interested in getting January as your um, as your event that you would like. Now the odds of getting, sorry, the probability of getting January is one in 12 because they're 12 months, that's 0 0.08. And the odds of getting January is the likelihood, likelihood of getting January divided by the likelihood of not getting January. I hope that makes sense. And that is 0 0.09. OK, and then we'll move on to a clinical example that I suspect all of you will relate to where you're doing a laparoscopy for acute right electrosa pain, let's say in, in young women. Now, the probability of finding a ruptured ectopic, which you suspect would be very uncommon, let's say is one in 100. So then the probability is 0 0.01, one in 100. And the odds of getting a finding a ruptured ectopic during laparoscopy for acute right left for pain would be one in a hundred divided by 99 over 100. So that'll be virtually 0 0.01, maybe slightly higher. Okay, so uh, these are some examples of probabilities and odds. And there are two important things that um, you can pick from uh, these examples. Uh, I don't know if Tara or Leonie will pause and uh, um, can you um, can you guess what these probably could be or have you got any questions in what I've said so far? No, um, uh, can you, can you... Tara for you. Any guesses? Is he gone offline? No. Uh, okay. Can you turn on your mic, mate? You can say no, but you don't have any guesses. Hello. 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 Yeah, go for it. Go for it. Sorry. Can you can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I didn't realize my microphone was off. I was just uh, asking for you to repeat the question. So um, I've given you a number of experiments with probabilities of events happening and odds sure. of events happening. Uh, can you see a pattern here? Yeah, I was actually trying to. Uh, so I was looking at the example of the, of the of the random selection of the month. So I was looking at the probabilities being one out of twelve, as you've as you put on the table, and then that would be one over twelve divided by um, eleven out of twelve to work out the odds. Um, yeah. If I'm if I'm following correctly, and Correct. that would not point not nine. So as your as your probability, uh, your probability of an event occurring decreases, your odds decreases, but at a slower rate. Is that? Yeah, yeah. And I think Maria has, uh, said, is it that the odds are always larger than the probability? That is correct. Yeah. So uh, that's correct. So I think you, you, you're getting to where I was hoping we would get at. So as the events become rarer and rarer, the odds and probabilities are coming closer to each other. So the odds are not far off from the probability. That's one. And always, always, the odds are going to be higher than the probabilities. OK, so those are two things that we need to just bear in mind. And that's what the next slide shows. The odds are always greater than the probability. And as the success becomes uncommon or the event becomes uncommon probability and odds become quite close uh, similar okay and if you do need to calculate the odds from a given probability that's pretty straightforward like i said the odds um are um uh, you get odds by dividing the probability by one minus probability 
because it's simply the likelihood of the event happening divided by the likelihood of the event not happening. And if you wanted to calculate probability from odds, P is equal to O by one plus O. This is just extra information. Don't worry too much about these formulae. We are surgeons after all, yeah? Right, so, so how does this take us to relative risk and odds ratios? Let's just talk about what relative risk means. So relative risk is also known as risk ratio, refers to the ratio of probabilities of a specific event occurring in two groups. So we just talk about probabilities of, event uh, of an event happening in one throw of dice or a toss of a coin and so on. But if you talk of probabilities of uh, an event happening in two different groups and you want to compare them and you take the ratio, that's a relative risk, also called risk ratio. Whereas odds ratio is it refers to the ratio of odds of a specific event occurring in two groups. So very simply, relative risk is ratio of probabilities, odds ratio is ratio of odds. Okay, right, let's um, go back to the example. So we talked about adjuvant radiotherapy after surgery for adrenal cancer. And the question that researchers wanted to ask was, does this improve survival? So here is a table, a two by two table, if you like, which shows data from one of these studies in the meta-analysis that we talked about before. And essentially, in this two by two table, you've got uh, columns of patients survived and patients died. So those are the two columns that you have. And two rows, one is a group of patients who had surgery with radiotherapy, and the other is a group of patients who had surgery and alone without radiotherapy, okay? And the number of patients who survived and died are um, described in this two by two table, all right? So if you want to look at the probability of patients surviving after having surgery and radiotherapy, you just have to take a, cell A, which is 31, divided by the total number of people who had radiotherapy, that, is, that gives you 0 0.79. Okay, so that hopefully should be straightforward. If you then look at the probability of patients surviving after just surgery, i.e. without radiotherapy, you've got 15 out of a total of 39, and the answer is 0 0.38. So you've got two probabilities here. And we said just a couple of minutes ago the relative risk of surviving with radiotherapy is simply the probability of surviving with radiotherapy divided by the prob probability of surviving without radiotherapy. That's 0 0.79 by 0 0.38, that's 2.07. Now, what does this mean? This, in very simple terms, simply means that you're probably two times or over two times more likely to survive if you had radiotherapy after the operation as opposed to not having radiotherapy. And obviously you've got to take into account the risks of radiotherapy before you decide on the risk benefit ratio for an individual patient. Okay, so that's relative risk and I hope that's um, um, clear uh, because now we'll move on to um, looking at relative risk in a slightly different manner. So I've got the same table here. So the table hasn't changed. So the example is the same. We're looking at the role of radiotherapy after surgery uh, on overall survival in adrenal cortical cancer. So we calculated just a couple of minutes ago that the relative risk of surviving if you had radiotherapy was 2.07, i.e. more than twofold. Now, if you looked at relative risk the another way, i.e. relative risk of dying without radiotherapy, so here we are saying, what's the risk of dying if you didn't have radiotherapy? Okay, and then what do you do? You take the probability of dying in the surgery alone group, that's here, D by C plus D, divided by the prob probability of dying in the surgery with radiotherapy group, that is B divided by A plus B, and lo and behold, the number is three. So you've got a different relative risk from the same data set because you're just looking at it in a different way. It's all about perspective. So you could tell the patient that, you know what, we give you radiotherapy and the chance of you surviving two years increases twofold. Or if you're very keen on giving radiotherapy, you could say, well, if you don't have radiotherapy, the chance of you dying go up threefold, okay? 
And this might seem very strange for people who look at this kind of data for the first time. They say, how do you get two different relative risks with the same numbers? But this is how you get it. It just depends on how you look at the data. OK, so we've looked at relative risk. Let's move on to odds ratio. So the only thing I want you to keep in mind here is that relative risk can be inflated if you like. You can use three instead of 2.7. It just depends on what relative risk you're talking about. Risk of dying without the additional treatment or risk of surviving with the additional treatment. Right. How about the odds ratio then? So you've got the same table here without uh, the um, row columns, and I'll explain that in a minute. So you first want to look at the odds of surviving with radiotherapy. So if you remember what we, what we said about odds, odds is a ratio of the probability of surviving to the probability of dying, i.e. not surviving. So it's A by B. So that's 31, 31 over 8, 3.88. And then you look at the odds of surviving without radiotherapy, so 15 over 24, or C over D, that's 0 0.63. And if you want the odds ratio, like you said before, odds ratio is the ratio of the two odds. So the ratio of two odds is A over B divided by C over D, which is essentially AD over BC. So you just multiply these two um, cells, divide by the product of these two cells, you get 6.16. So it's the same data set. Remember, we said the relative risk is two of surviving with radiotherapy. Here we're saying the odds ratio is 6.6. .6. So what does this mean? And would you use the relative risk or the odds ratio to communicate risk? Now, we've said before that relative risk simply means um, twofold. So if you said the relative risk is two, you're saying there's a twofold higher chance of dying. Okay, so it's fairly simple to explain. It's fairly logical and intuitive. The odds ratio, however, isn't. And a lot of people mistake the odds ratio um, to mean um, relative risk. So they, they would, um, I've heard a number of people look at this data and say, right, you've got a sixfold higher risk of surviving if you have radiotherapy. And that is simply incorrect. It's a relative risk of two. So you've got only a twofold increased risk of surviving, not sixfold. Okay. So odds ratios essentially are very difficult to explain and to understand. So it's very difficult to use for communication of risk and uh, um, best avoided. Okay. So you would always use a relative risk to communicate uh, risk, or you should always use a relative risk. Okay. And then the question is why would you? even calculate the odds ratio or why would you present it in your report and a cynic would say oh that's because the odds ratio is much higher and you'll have a greater impact in your abstract and so on and so forth but we'll come to another explanation in a minute right that's the um, explanation so when do you use odds ratio and when do you use the relative risk so it's the same table the only additions are row totals and column totals so here i've added I've just said that this particular column, uh, if you add A and B, um, you get your row totals, A and B for the top row, C and D for the bottom row, and then you've got the column totals here, A plus C and B plus D. Now, the most important information you need to know before you decide which is appropriate, which to calculate, is study design. So we talked previously about two main types of observational studies. One is a case control, the other is a cohort study. Randomized controlled trials are, are considered similar to the cohort studies, except that they have an element of an intervention or, uh, and randomization. So um, that's what you need to know. So essentially, if it's a cohort study, you would be starting off with a group of patients with adrenal cancer, and you'd be starting off with the intervention, you follow them up over time, and you then see how many died and how many survived. So by definition, cohort studies start with exposure, involve a period of follow-up, it mimics what happens in real life. So in these instances, you should just use the relative risk. Okay? The other type of study that we talked about is the case control study. So in a case control study, you're starting off with the outcomes. 
you you take a hundred patients who've survived, you take another hundred patients who have died from adrenal cancer, you look into their case records to see how many had radiotherapy and how many didn't, and then you do the study in a retrospective fashion to derive these numbers in the table. So you start off with the outcome. It does not reflect real life. Why? Because you take an arbitrary number of survivors and, and an arbitrary number of people who died. You're not starting with a population of adrenal cancer. You're starting with people who died of adrenal cancer and people who survived adrenal cancer. So that does not reflect real life proportions. And in a case control study where you do not have real life data, you are unable to get to row totals. You're unable to get to A plus B and C plus D because you're taking survivors and uh, uh, and people who didn't survive and you're simply looking at column totals and going back to see how many had surgery with radiotherapy and how many didn't. Okay, so if you do not have row totals, then you should not be artificially calculating relative risk. So you're, um, you're constrained to only use odds ratios. So in case control studies, you have to use odds ratios because you don't have a choice. In cohort studies, we advise you use relative risk because odd ratios would give you an exaggerated estimate of risk. Okay, so I hope that is clear, but let's just summarize what we've um, discussed so far. So relative risk, if you remember, is a ratio of probabilities. Okay, whereas odds ratio is a ratio of odds. The relative risk, I hope you'll agree, is that it's easy to understand, easy to explain, easy to use. There is odds ratio for the non-statistician is ambiguous and a bit um, uh, difficult to get your head around. Remember, relative risks are always smaller. You can increase it kind of artificially by looking at relative risk the other way around. You know, instead of survival, you can look at uh, relative risk of dying. And you might find that the numbers are a bit different and you might be tempted to use a larger number. Not that I'm advocating that. Odds ratio is always larger than the relative risk, however you look at it. OK, and I've just been explaining that in a cohort study, you should only use the relative risk. In, an odds, uh, in a case control study, you can only use the odds ratio. You just can't calculate relative risk or you shouldn't calculate the relative risk. OK. Um, and the last point, uh, this is more for people with an interest in statistics, um, but you could be, um, it's good, useful to be aware that if you're looking at relative risk, adjusting for confounding variables and doing the complex multivariable calculations can be a little bit difficult, but these days it can all be done with all the software that we have. And with odds ratios, they've always been considered easy to manipulate and adjust for confounding variables, and that's one of the reasons people used to um, like to use odds ratios in multivariable analysis. Right, so sometimes it doesn't really matter. You'll be pleased to know. So when does it not really matter? So this is a very interesting um, graph that compares the relative risk on the, on the x-axis with the odds ratio on the y-axis. So if you look very carefully just at the um, diagonal line, just going straight across the um, screen, this is a line where the relative risk and the odds ratio are virtually the same. And this seems to happen when the incidence is very uncommon. So the I0 refers to uh, the probability of the event happening in real life. So if that event is a rare event, i.e. dying uh, may be an event, and if it's very rare, then it doesn't matter whether you talk about the relative risk or the odds ratio because they're virtually the same, okay? So just like we said with the example of you do a laparoscopy for acute right hand for the pain, and what are the chances of finding an ectopic pregnancy? It's very rare. So in those instances, whether you talk of probabilities or odds, it doesn't really matter. So similarly, if the event is rare, it doesn't matter whether you talk of relative risk or odds. However, as the event becomes more and more common, and these are the lines that you get for, uh, as the um, probability of the event happening increases. So this refers to 1 in 20, this is 1 in 10, this line refers to 1 in 5, 1 in 3, and then half. So as the event becomes more and more common, the odds ratio becomes an extremely exaggerated estimate of relative risk. For example, if the relative risk is 2, 
and you have um, an event that happens one third of the time, the odds ratio is about eight or nine or something like that. So this is something that uh, you need to keep in mind. If it's a rare event, it doesn't really matter what you use. If it's a common event, then you've got to be careful. So going back to a forest plot um, of uh, overall survival in, in adrenal cancer with and without adjuvant radiotherapy, I started off showing this plot and highlighting the difference in the odds ratio that was reported in the paper of 6.2. And this is for a cohort study. Where in a cohort study, ideally, you'd want to use a relative risk. And so when I calculated the, calculated the relative risk, I got a value of two. I mean, that's a massive difference. And readers may be tempted to go with the reported odds and use that in their discussions with patients and say, you know what, you really should have radiotherapy. There may be a six-fold or up to a six-fold increased risk of um, or increased chance of you surviving, which clearly is erroneous and misleading. I hope you agree. Right. So we come to the learning points. So we've talked about two key ways of comparing risk, the odds ratio and relative risk. Um, I've explained that odds ratio almost always exaggerates risk. So only use when relative risk is not available because of the study design, the constraints of the study design. We've said relative risk is intuitive, self-explanatory and preferable. So when you're critiquing a paper, look to see what measure of risk is being used. Have a think about whether it's appropriate. And quite importantly, look for the individual probabilities in both groups, the absolute numbers. What's the risk in this group and what's the risk in the other group? Whenever you can to decide on whether the risk difference is clinically relevant. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in and listening. Until next time, keep running your life with our surgical podcast. <laughs>